Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Couchet, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversation with news and policymakers, people doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are focusing on the life of the late, influential American diplomat George Kennan. As many of you in this room know, uh, George Kennan uh, was a son of Milwaukee. He had a, a, a truly a fascinating and important career. And while I can't do it justice in 30 seconds or so, we'll touch on a few of the highlights here. He was, as some of you know, uh, the author of the strategy of containment uh, that defined this country's policy toward the Soviet Union during the Cold War. He was one of the architects of the Marshall Plan, an advisor to presidents, ambassador to uh, Yugoslavia, ambassador to the Soviet Union. In his later years, he won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for his uh, uh, historic writings. Um, and he also uh, was an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War and of the nuclear arms race. All of that and much, much more is captured in this book, George F. Kennan and American Life. Um, this book, uh, which is uh, remarkable and tells the story of this uh, very brilliant but complicated man, is the work of the gentleman seated next to me, Professor John Lewis Gaddis. He is the noted Cold War historian, Yale University professor, and we are delighted to have you here at Marquette University Law School. Please give him a warm welcome Thank to you. George Kennan's hometown. Thank you. Good to have you here. I said I, I didn't do him justice, and, and I didn't. Uh, so I'll let you do that. Uh, how would you describe the influence of George Kennan uh, on, on this country's foreign policy? Well, Mike, um, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, I think I would put it a little more broadly than that. I, I would say I think we ought to think about George Kennan's influence on the 20th century as a whole. Because if you think about the 20th century, the first half of it was terrible. The second half of it was much better. How come? Who developed the ideas that made the second half of the 20th century better than the first half? I don't mean to say George Kennan did all of that, but if I were to pick uh, one central idea that was key to making the second half of the 20th century more peaceful than the first half, I think it was the idea of containment. I think it was the idea that we could deal with the Soviet Union without having a new world war with them on the one hand, but without appeasing them on the other hand. And that really was George Kennan's idea. So I would say if we back off and look at big ideas and big consequences, this man is extraordinarily influential. How did you end up uh, becoming the authorized biographer? What, if any, conditions were there on this project? Well, this is almost a total mystery to me, <laughs> because uh, I was a very junior instructor teaching not at Yale, but at Ohio University in 1981. I had published a book on the idea of containment. It was not a biography of George Kennan. And I sent uh, Professor Kennan, as I called him at that point, uh, draft chapters to read. And he read them, and very quickly I got notes back. Uh, one was uh, handwritten. You have understood my views better than anyone else ever has. And so I wrote back and said, thank you very much. That's very nice to hear. And then there was another letter like this. You, underlined, have understood my views better than anyone else ever has. And there were about three like this, progressing from underlining to capital letters and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it occurred to me, maybe he's angling for a biography. And um, this had not occurred to me, uh, but I wrote him and said, is anyone doing your biography, Professor Kennan? He wrote back and said, oh, it had never occurred to him that anybody would want to do <laughs> his biography. But now that I had raised the issue, uh, perhaps we should talk about it. And so fairly quickly, we worked out the arrangement, which was a remarkably generous arrangement. It's the dream arrangement that any biographer hopes for which is total access to the person that you're writing about, total access to the papers, the diaries, the family, the contemporaries, the circle in which he moved. But at the same time, total independence, so that he understood that he would never read the book. The book would appear posthumously. I would be completely free to say whatever I wanted to say in this. And it was the perfect um, deal. 
except that he was 78 when we made this deal, and he lived to be 101. <laughs> <laughs> Passed away in 2005. 2005, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is uh, uh, <laughs> remarkable about this book is the rich detail in it, and, and that is provided in many respects by George Kennan himself, who was a mm -hmm. prolific writer. He wrote oh, everything down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one of the things I say in the book, uh, Mike, which I hope others will take um, up and develop more fully than I was able to do, I think George Kennan was one of the greatest American writers of the 20th century. And I think when his diaries are published, as they will be in a couple of years, uh, this reputation will emerge alongside all of the other reputations that, that he has. And of course, the quality of his writing made it a joy to work on this book because there are diaries going all the way back to Milwaukee in 1916 uh, and all the way through to the last year of his life. They are beautifully written, wonderful descriptions uh, in these. And so it was a huge challenge uh, to me to try to write halfway as well as George Kennan did. You could not just let this be a badly written biography of someone who wrote as beautifully as he did. And that was one of the great challenges of this project. He wrote about his dreams, his, his, mm -hmm. his deep self-doubt, mm -hmm. everything. I went to see him one day toward the end of his life. And um, my wife and I were visiting him in Princeton. And he pulled out a big file drawer. And he said, these are the diaries from 1970 to the present moment, uh, the originals, the only copies. And he said, they go with you. Load them up in your car. Um, fortunately, it was a van. <laughs> and then on top of this, there was a little black book. And he said, I guess you wouldn't be interested in that. And I said, what is it? He said, it's my dream diary going back some 50 years or so. And so, yes, indeed, he did record dreams extraordinarily vividly. So I am able to say on such and such a night, George Kennan dreamed the following. And very few biographers actually have that privilege. This book is uh, 700 pages, 784 with footnotes. You said it easily could have been 1,500 pages. Oh, it could have been more than that, even. It could have been one of these. It could have been Robert Cairo, but thank goodness it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, walk through his life chronologically. Sure. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, he was born in Milwaukee. He was born to a tax attorney uh, here in Milwaukee. His, his mother died uh, soon after birth, born on the east side, Cambridge Avenue, um, not far from Juneau Park. Uh, how did the fact that, that uh, his mother was not present in his life affect him throughout his life? This was the great tragedy with which his life began because she died only two months after he was born in 1904. And for a long time, he blamed himself. He thought she had died in childbirth, which was not the case. It was appendicitis, completely different. But he thought that uh, for a long time. So not only was there that, that sense of guilt, but there was this sense of loneliness um, growing up without a mother. There were nurses. There eventually was a stepmother. There were surrogate mothers. But there was a huge empty place in his life and heart as a result of that. And he never got over this. Uh, he could still, the tears could come down his cheeks when he was in his 90s talking about the effect of her death on him. So I think it really is a starting point in thinking about his emotional fragility, his vulnerability, and I think quite extraordinary for someone who's often thought of as a, uh, really the quintessential member of the American establishment. He never felt that he was part of any establishment. He was always lonely wherever he was, and surely this has something to do with that. He, he went to uh, uh, a school out at St. John's Military uh, he Academy. Did. He did. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then went on to Princeton, and Princeton was That's a bit right. of culture mm -hmm. shock for him, was it not? Well, Princeton would have been a culture shock, I think, for anybody from the Midwest in 1921, because there were not that many Midwesterners at Princeton uh, at that time. And surely it was for George, uh, not just because of the very great cultural differences that existed, but uh, he had no money, or really very little money, no money by Princeton standards. And so that was a, a big difference uh, as well from most of his contemporaries. So he paints in his memoirs, which came out in 1967, a very, very grim picture of Princeton. But I found when I got into his diaries that actually he did have fun 
at Princeton. He did some of the normal things that undergraduates uh, did. He did actually go out and get drunk and carouse once <laughs> or twice here and there. And that was kind of reassuring to me. Uh, uh, his experience was more normal than he portrayed it as. But it was also a caution about memoirs because another part of the challenge of writing this book is that this is someone who wrote uh, two volumes of wonderful memoirs, the first of which won the Pulitzer. Uh, and so how do you say things differently from what was said in these extraordinary memoirs? But I found it was not a problem because memoirs are themselves fallible. Uh, they are always written without seeing all the documents. There are always differences in the documents from what people remember. Memory itself is, is a fragile thing. And uh, so uh, I was able to find, um, all the way through this project, places where I would challenge uh, the memoir, uh, sometimes reinforcing it, but quite often challenging it. And so in a way, I felt like I was arguing with George Kennan all the way through this project. And in some way, I guess I was. How did he uh, choose the Foreign Service? How did he choose <coughs> his career? Because there is an interesting connection. We know George F. Kennan, but there was another George Kennan That's who, in correct. some respects, shaped his life. That's right. That's quite true. There is um, the first George Kennan, who had no middle name. Uh, and the first George Kennan, born in 1845 in Ohio, was the first great explorer of Siberia. And this is eastern Siberia. This is the most remote portion of Siberia. And he went there in 1865 with a view to constructing the first telegraph line to Europe because people were not sure that the Atlantic Cable would work. And so there was this ambitious scheme to build a telegraph line up uh, through uh, Alaska and across the Bering Strait and so on. And the elder Kennan was in eastern Siberia for something like three years to survey that project. And it's an epic adventure that he later wrote about in his own memoir composed when he was 25 called Tent Life in Siberia. It's still a great read uh, today. But this Kennan later became uh, one of, uh, uh, um, certainly the most prominent critic of the first gulag, and this is the Tsar's prison system in Siberia. And so in the 1880s, and particularly with the publication of his book, Siberia and the Exile System in 1891, um, the first George Kennan became famous and got himself kicked out of Russia and became a hero, ironically, to the Bolsheviks, many of whom had been locked up in these prisons. So when the second George Kennan went to Moscow for the first time, when diplomatic relations are established in 1933, there are old Bolsheviks who are very interested in him because they say he is, they weren't quite sure what the relationship was, but that he is connected to the first George Kennan. So George Frost Kennan decided to uh, focus his expertise on the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. he, he spoke fluent Russian, yes. spoke beautifully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you mentioned when he was first assigned to Moscow, uh, it became clear that he had an affinity for the Russian <laughs> yes. people. Uh -huh. He did. He chose, um, he was offered several different uh, specialties in the Foreign Service. He could have learned Chinese, he could have learned Arabic, he could have learned Japanese. He chose to learn Russian. And this was because of the first um, Kennan. And it's very interesting how he learned Russian, because this is the 1920s. He's working for the State Department. There are no diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union at that time. So he can't go to Russia, ironically. So he goes to the Baltic states where there are a lot of uh, Russian exiles and also to Germany um, in this period, Weimar Germany, and learns classical Russian, 19th century literary Russian, and learns then to love the great 19th century literary classics. Uh, so Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Gogol and Pushkin uh, and Chekhov especially, who, all of whom he could read in the original. And this was extremely powerful in shaping his view of the Soviet Union because he concluded early on from this uh, study of 19th century Russian culture that communism would never fit it. It was simply inconsistent with the Russian national character. And he's on record saying this as early as 1932. And it's extraordinary to have that kind of grand strategic insight predicting what was going to happen 50 years later 
emerge out of the reading of novels and plays. So the lesson, which I tell my students, read liter literature. It's extraordinarily important to do this. As a younger man, he, he sort of had a, my take on it was sort of a love-hate relationship with the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. He, he was frustrated at many times, threatened to mm -hmm. quit uh, mm -hmm. many times. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of George's great friends was Paul Nitze, who was on the opposite side of many of the great political issues of the Cold War period. And uh, Nitze's grandson, Nick Thompson, wrote a dual biography of uh, his grandfather and George Kennan, which came out. A couple of years ago, it's a good book called The Hawk and the Dove. And Nick and I were sharing a platform in Washington a couple of weeks ago. And this same question came up about the Foreign Service. And I said, yes, I think that George must hold the record for having resigned or threatened to resign from the Foreign Service more often than anybody else uh, did. And Nick said, that's nothing. My grandfather has the record for having been fired from more administrations <laughs> than anybody <laughs> So it would be safe to say that, and I'm going to fast forward here because there's a lot to talk about. Um, at the age of 42, mm -hmm. 1946, we'll move forward mm -hmm. to 1946, mm -hmm. um, he writes what is, what's become known now as the Long mm -hmm. Telegram. Uh, many people in this room probably know this story, but I'll have you tell it. It sure. was remarkable in its length mm -hmm. and really in many respects was his assessment of mm -hmm. Soviet intentions. Absolutely. But the important thing to understand about the long telegram is that it was a telegram. Normally, if you were in Moscow, you would write long dispatches and send them by pouch, and they would go to the State Department. It would take them 10 days or two weeks to get there, and then they would go into the files, and nobody would ever read them. Uh, and George had written um, dozens of these in the, uh, in the two years that he'd been back, 1944 to 1946 warning that we could not count on the alliance with the Soviet Union continuing after the war. Stalin was going to be um, a, a real danger uh, to us. Nobody paid any attention. He is frustrated. He is um, announcing his resignation again. This was resignation number six, I think, probably. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's um, sick in bed with the flu and toothache and just general discontent, which is characteristic of anybody who's living through winter in Moscow in that period. And a request comes from the State Department. Please explain why the Soviets are being so difficult. And he just blows his top, completely uh, loses it, and calls in his secretary and dictates in a rage this telegram of some 5,000 uh, words or dictates this uh, outburst of some 5,000 words. And then he sends it by telegram, not by pouch. And that broke all the rules uh, for telegrams, uh, the length of telegrams. I was talking to some kids the other day about this, trying to explain it. And I was uh, trying to explain it. Just imagine that you could do a tweet of 140 <laughs> words, not 140 characters and think how impressive this would be to all of your friends. They would all read it, you see, <laughs> because you've broken the rules. And this is what the long telegram was, and this is why it got read, because of the rage and the violation of the rules with which he sent it. But once they read it, people in the State Department, it was so eloquent, it was so succinct, it was so logical, it explained so much that that became the central idea of the grand strategy of the United States for the Cold War period. And, so it's and, extraordinary. And he laid out that strategy in more detail about a year later in an article mm -hmm. written mm -hmm. by Mr. X. It was That's supposed right. to be anonymous for right. Foreign mm -hmm. Affairs magazine, but mm -hmm. it quickly became known yes. that George Kennan uh -huh. was the author. Oh, yes. Well, what happened was the long telegram made his reputation, and so instead of being allowed to resign, he is brought back to Washington and is actually put in charge of designing American grand strategy for the uh, post-war period. Um, and there was some desire to have some kind of a public explanation of that out there. Uh, and yet, um, Kennan is working for General Marshall at this point on the policy planning staff, which is supposed to be a pretty secret uh, operation. So Kennan wrote uh, the article for Foreign Affairs, but just signed it X, uh, and that was it. So that piqued people's curiosity in the first place. A lot more people read it just because of the X, you know. Uh, but then when they read it, they found quotations in it from Edward Gibbon and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and even more extraordinary, from Thomas Mann's great novel, Buddenbrook's 
about a German family declining with a very formidable exterior facade, but internal rot, you see, and so on. And these are quoted in the X article, and so the word got around, well, who in Washington would read Edward Gibbon and Thomas Mann in the first place? Very few people. So um, his name leaked within about a week. His cover was blown within a week, and uh, so he became famous at that point. As he grew older, uh, was he comfortable being known as the author of containment? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> to the contrary. Um, the problem was uh, that containment was a very general idea, but George himself wanted to micromanage the implementation of containment. And for a year or so, he was able to do this from the standpoint of the, or from the position of the policy planning staff. But very quickly, it became clear that he could not micromanage everything. You, know, you could not run covert operations, which is a George Kennan invention, actually, uh, in 1947, 48. Um, all covert operations cannot be run out of the policy planning staff, which has a staff of five at that time. And it was ridiculous. Uh, and that was just uh, typical of the problem. Uh, his impracticality uh, in dealing with the bureaucracy did not have the ability to delegate authority, to trust others, he got rattled when there would be the slightest departure from uh, his scheme. He was um, a very good sailor, but he was not capable in the policy world of doing the things, the kinds of things that a sailor has to do, which is when you're blown off course, let yourself be blown off course, hoist the right sails, avoid the right rocks, uh, change the course, but get back on course later on. He couldn't do this. And so he became early on uh, within the government um, a very vigorous critic of uh, even the Truman administration's uh, approach to containment, strongly opposed the formation of NATO, for example. Um, and then by the 1950s has gone public with his criticisms of American foreign policy. And certainly was the first major establishment figure, as you said, Mike, to uh, come out against the Vietnam War in 1966 but also a very long-term and uh, eloquent critic of the nuclear arms race uh, as well. So when uh, in um, 1994, his 90th birthday, the Council on Foreign Relations tried to honor him uh, with a celebration as the father of containment, he would have none of it. He got up and made a speech <laughs> in which he said, he did not say thank you for honoring me, you know, he said, um, uh, Containment was a terrible idea, and it was a mistake, and I'm sorry I ever thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> he saw, uh, uh, when he believed in the idea of containment earlier in his career, mm -hmm. he saw the demise of the Soviet Union happening much more quickly than yes. it did. What, 15, 20 years? That's what he thought, roughly 15 years. Um, and he thought it would happen simply because of this inconsistency between Marxist-Leninist um, ideology and the Russian national character. And he thought that either the Russian people would overthrow the Soviet system, or that more likely some Soviet leader would come to power and just realize that the system was not working and would change it from the top. Uh, but he really thought uh, that it would happen within about 15 years. And of course, it took closer to 45 for that to happen. But he blamed us. He blamed the Americans for that, because he said if we had not built up so many arms, if we had not formed the NATO alliance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the Russians would have been willing to move toward this at an earlier stage. Uh, I'm not persuaded of that. I think it really took the changes, uh, the problems of the 1970s. I think it took the advent of a completely new generation like Gorbachev's generation uh, to bring this about. Uh, but uh, that was how he saw it as happening. And of course, in the end, uh, it happened very much in the way that um, he predicted. But when I would go to him and say, don't you feel vindicated about this? No way. And I would get another tirade about containment. So um, he was one of these people who was incapable of self-congratulation. It really is an extraordinary thing. He was much prouder, on the other hand, of, of the Marshall Plan. Oh, yes. And with good reason because the Marshall Plan was a classic uh, application of leverage, of doing a lot with a little. And it's very interesting where the idea of the Marshall Plan comes from, because I think it comes from 
Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, and I think it comes from reading Tolstoy, reading War and Peace. Because if you think about what uh, Kutuzov, the old Russian general, let Napoleon do, it was to uh, move into the interior of Russia, actually to take Moscow, and then to ask this elemental question, uh, which is uh, extraordinarily important in grand strategy. Having got what you want, Moscow, what do you do next? And Napoleon had no answer. So uh, Kennan drew the conclusion that uh, at the end of World War II, Stalin had got Eastern Europe because of where the Red Army was, and he'd got a third of Germany. But Kennan was asking the question, what do you do next? What do you do with it? Because these people don't speak Russian, they have a very different culture, uh, and uh, you are not going to be able to rebuild their economies. They are going to be rebellious, they are going to be resentful. Their uh, resentfulness will be a source of weakness to you in the long run and not strength, so what do you do with it in the first place? That was the question. And so the problem was to keep the rest of Europe from becoming demoralized with this outcome of the war. And that's where the Marshall Plan was um, so successful because simply the promise uh, that the United States would come in and help to rebuild Western Europe, even before we did any rebuilding, just the promise of it, was enough to turn the psychological attitudes around, uh, both in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, that was absolutely fundamental. And that was basically Kennan's idea. Kennan even had the idea, Mike, of offering Marshall Plan aid to the Soviet Union and to the satellite states of Eastern Europe, uh, with the expectation, of course, that they would turn it down, which they did, but it was a very risky enterprise because the whole thing would have gone down the tubes if they had accepted. The Congress would never have approved it. But uh, the effect of this was to cause Stalin to be the one that drew the line in Europe and divided Europe and not us, and that was the grand strategic objective of the Marshall Plan. I mentioned earlier that, that he served as ambassador to both Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. You said neither of those experiences ended well. Why, why was he not effective in those roles? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a puzzle because he was a professional foreign service officer, so you would think that he would be trained for an ambassadorship in a major country. This is what all foreign service officers um, aspired to. What happened in Russia was that he was appointed ambassador in 1952. It was the last year of Stalin's life. It was the last year of the Truman administration. It was not a good time. The Korean War was still going on uh, at this point. Uh, Kennan had the idea that he would be able to go in and negotiate personally with Stalin and negotiate an end to the Cold War, but there could not have been a worse time for this uh, with no instructions coming out of Washington and with uh, the attitude of hostility in Moscow. And so Kennan's emotional fragility uh, simply got to him again, as often happened to him. He took personally the anti-American posters that were uh, all over uh, Moscow. Uh, the Soviets tried to compromise the embassy a couple of times by having a defector break in and, and ask for asylum. And this kind of stuff had been going on before. There was nothing new about it, but somehow it really affected Kennan. And so uh, about four months after arriving, he was flying out through Berlin, and uh, there was a press conference. And some reporter said, uh, what is life like in Moscow, Mr. Ambassador? And he said, it reminds me of being interned in Nazi Germany in 1942. Now, this was not the most tactful thing to say. <laughs> in 1952 in the city of Berlin. And so he was immediately declared persona non grata. He was kicked out. The only American ambassador in something like 230 years of Russian-American relations to have been kicked out. And there we are. And it was simply his emotional volatility that contributed to this. He was uh, uh, in favor and out of favor with various administrations. <laughs> He, he became in favor again with John F. Kennedy. That's he, right. He uh -huh. really liked mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy. Why? Well, Kennedy liked him. Um, he liked being liked. Uh, George did yeah. like being liked, mm -hmm. like most of us. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, Kennedy uh, had uh, himself, Kennedy was himself a, a sometime historian, and by this time George Kennan had become a historian. And so uh, Kennedy had... Uh, complimented uh, George's history books that had been published back in the 50s while Kennedy was still in the, in the Senate. 
And Kennedy was interested in shaking up the status quo in Soviet-American relations. So when he becomes president, he appoints George Ambassador not to the Soviet Union, but to Yugoslavia, which is a very interesting country because of Tito's defection from the uh, Soviet uh, bloc. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, this is a great thing to Kennan. It's a kind of vindication to be appointed to another ambassadorship. And the relationship between the two of them was re really remarkably close. I figured out with the help of one of my assistants that uh, they met Kennedy and uh, Kennan something like 14 times uh, in the period when Kennedy was in the White House, which is quite extraordinary for an ambassador who was overseas most of that time. But the uh, ambassadorship failed, not because of Kennedy, really, but it failed over a very mundane matter. And this was the, uh, uh, according to most favored nation treatment, trade uh, status to the Yugoslavs and the conservative uh, anti-communist caucus within the Congress of the United States uh, was trying to withhold that. And so Kennan ran afoul, improbably, of uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, the formidable Wilbur Mills of Arkansas. Does anybody remember Wilbur Mills? Uh, <laughs> and Wilbur Mills could not be budged. Uh, now, of course, this was just normal domestic politics, but for George, it was a personal insult. And so, uh, in this case, he does not resign. He doesn't get himself kicked out, but he makes it clear that he's going to go back to Princeton and write um, history. And uh, so that one ended unhappily as well, but still with extraordinary respect on Kennan's part for John F. Kennedy. It, you mentioned, uh, Professor Gaddis, that uh, he became an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. In fact, mm -hmm. his testimony in front of mm -hmm. a congressional committee mm -hmm. in many ways legitimized mm -hmm. the anti-war mm -hmm. movement. And, and then he also became very outspoken uh, in his criticism of the, the arms race. That's correct. Um, uh -huh. Had his politics changed, or was this still the same George Kennan? I think it was pretty much the same George Kennan. You have to understand he was not an Asian expert, so he was not following Vietnamese affairs very closely. But when the major escalation took place in 1965-66, he raised a very simple question. What are we doing there? What are we trying to achieve? What's the purpose? And there was no very good answer to that uh, question. But the actual television testimony, which is February of uh, 1966, came as a surprise to George. Uh, Bill Fulbright was uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at that point and had asked Kennan to come in and testify, which was not unusual. Kennan did this frequently. But he didn't tell Kennan that it was going to be covered on national television the day that uh, Kennan came in. And so uh, the national television networks are covering Kennan's testimony. He's on the stand for something like five hours, and the whole country comes to a halt because he was so eloquent and he was so uh, establishment at a time when the criticism of the Vietnam War was from uh, professors doing teach-ins or from uh, student youth, and to have George Kennan up there in his three-piece suit with his gold chain and all of that criticizing the Vietnam War was uh, extraordinary. So it really was very important in turning opinion around against the Vietnam War. And it's a, another characteristic of something that happened frequently in George's life, which is that when he would not prepare something, when he would do something spontaneously, it could have a huge impact, like the Lung Telegram, for example. Uh, when he would try to prepare something, when he would really write a formal lecture or write a big book with a, with a view to trying to alert people about the danger of nuclear war, um, it fell flat. Uh, nobody would pay any attention to it at all. So he was someone who achieved his notoriety through spontaneity. But just think about how that would work. I mean, you would never know when what you say was going to catch on or not under that circumstance. And so that was one of the other things that was one of a source of great puzzlement to him. We'll open it up to audience questions in a moment, but I did want to spend a couple of minutes on, on Ken and the man because mm -hmm. an extremely complicated guy <laughs> wrestled with his feelings about this country. I, yes. I read a quote mm -hmm. in your book and it was back from the mid 1930s. <laughs> and and I think he sent a, a letter to his sister, and, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna tr it stuck with mm -hmm. me. He said something to the effect that he, he hates the rough and tumble of our politics. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the United mm -hmm. States politics. I, 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 hate the, our, I hate our democracy. I hate the press. I hate the people, P-E-E-P-U-L. Yes. I am clearly becoming un-American. Yeah. And he's, mm -hmm. but throughout his life, he wrestled with what yep. this country had become and what he 
remembered it as being That's when he right. grew up in yeah. Milwaukee. That letter is about 1936, I think. Um, I think the, understand, the way to understand uh, Kennan on this is to understand Milwaukee, but to understand Milwaukee as it was uh, in about 1915 or so. And then if you can just think about freezing Milwaukee in amber so that it doesn't change uh, in all the time that comes after that, that is what George Kennan would have preferred. But actually what happens is that he goes off and spends uh, five or six or eight years or whatnot abroad, and then he comes back and he finds Milwaukee has changed. Wisconsin has changed, for example. There are automobiles running up and down the highway, he discovers. You know, Well, you would think he would have noticed that from afar, but somehow it didn't register until he came back and he did not approve of automobiles. There is advertising along the highway, so he doesn't approve of that. That was not there in his youth, you see. So I think what happened was that he had this very romantic sense of the place where he grew up and the circumstances in which he grew up despite all the sadness that was associated with it. He didn't want it to change, and he could not come to grips with the fact that it was changing. And that was true of his attitudes toward this place, toward Wisconsin, but it was true of his attitudes toward the whole country, it seems to me, which just never quite lived up to what the country once had been. Would it be fair, Professor, to call him an elitist? Oh, yes. Goodness, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he called himself an elitist all the time. <laughs> uh, he believed he was an elitist in the sense that he really did believe that professionals should run things. Uh, he was not a great enthusiast for democracy uh, as such. He never understood American politics, never had much interest uh, in uh, American politics. He was not an elitist in the sense of uh, uh, believing somehow that um, class or wealth uh, or social position should cause you to be an elitist because he himself was from this middle class Milwaukee background. He was not an East Coast establishment elitist uh, in that sense. But he did have this extraordinarily strong sense of professionalism uh, within the Foreign Service that what the country needed was for the professionals to run things and any time that domestic politics or Congress or uh, other parochial pressures uh, got involved, he was horrified. He was upset. The saddest thing for him about Milwaukee was uh, the support for Joe McCarthy that existed within this town and within that, this state uh, in, that, in that period. And Joe McCarthy was just a, an extraordinary uh, symbol of all the things that he thought were wrong with uh, American politics. He had deep self-doubts. Uh, in today's world, if we were to look at George Kennan, mm -hmm. would we say he suffered from clinical depression? Did he, mm -hmm. uh, he, he seemed to really wrestle with a lot of uh, in, internal uh, issues. I think um, he bordered on this uh, many times. I'm not a professional um, um, analyst and can't really say whether he meets that definition or not. But uh, clearly uh, there was uh, depression as we would understand it in a general sense. Clearly there was a connection to health because he suffered from ulcers all of his life and other ailments and these were related clearly to his state of mind at any given time. I think that um, uh, I, I, he never systematically went through therapy. Um, this I know. I know he consulted an analyst maybe once or twice. But I think the reason he didn't do that, or the reason he felt he didn't need to do it, was his diary. The diary was the therapist. And this is what you have to understand when you read this thing, because to read it makes it look like uh, he's on the verge of commitment somewhere, because uh, the, you know, everything is so bleak, and he is so self-lacerating uh, in his views. But I think you have to understand that this was a stabilizing mechanism for him. It was a substitute for a therapist. It was a way of just pouring out all the kinds of things that you would pour out uh, to a therapist. Uh, and no doubt it was considerably cheaper as well. Uh, <laughs> so this is why the diaries are such extraordinary reading, because it really is as if uh, they are the therapist for somebody who lived a century. Uh, and uh, they are... The only other things that I know like them are the education of Henry Adams, Henry Adams' autobiography, uh, 
and the diaries of John Quincy Adams, which are also extraordinary. And of course, they didn't have therapists back in that period. So diaries can serve that function, and they certainly did for, for Kenneth. My final question. Yes, sir. Um, did, a lot of people saw him as being prophetic. Uh, did he see himself in that way? Um, I think he was prophetic. Um, I think he was prophetic about several different things. I think he was surely prophetic about the Soviet Union uh, being a, an ephemeral um, phenomenon in the long, deep course of Russian culture and Russian history. Nobody else saw that as clearly as George did. I think he was prophetic about the nuclear danger. He was one of the very first to warn about the ecological consequences of nuclear weapons, and as early as 1950, uh, is saying there is no way in which these weapons can rationally be used, and we should be moving toward a no first use mm -hmm. policy, which would lead to abolition uh, itself. I think that was prophetic uh, as well. I think it was prophetic uh, about the Vietnam War. He understood the dangers of overcommitment in a region in which you have not been precise about asking the question, why are you there? What are the vital interests uh, that are at stake uh, there for sure? So we study him in the Yale Grand Strategy Seminar as one of the great grand strategists uh, of um, all time, really, frankly. I mean, we study him alongside Thucydides and, and Sun Tzu and Clausewitz and Bismarck and Kissinger. Uh, so he's up in that mm -hmm. category. But this doesn't mean it was right all the time. It doesn't mean it was prophetic at all moments. And this is what makes him uh, an extraordinarily interesting figure for uh, uh, biography, for sure. But I think the same would be true if you would go back and look at those other grand strategists of the past. They had good days and bad days, too, I think. <laughs> Let's take a few questions from the audience. Ryan and Christine have microphones, or John has a microphone. Mm -hmm. And just identify yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Pastor Gaddis, my name is Tim Rathke. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I actually grew up, as I emailed you, about four blocks from <laughs> Mr. Ken <laughs> in the east side of Milwaukee. <laughs> a little later, but yep. um, great book and Thank great you. work have you done over the years. My question to you regarding the long telegram. <clears throat> One thing, when I read the biography, and I was familiar with that, um, with that telegram um, through school over the years, <laughs> but what was amazing is that it seemed like from his early points in the foreign ministry, you know, in the foreign, <laughs> to 1946, the long telegram, that he seemed to try to break the seal, to mm -hmm. have someone listen to him mm -hmm. on what he was forming as his, you know, analysis of the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. And like you said, it, it almost like he had to like trip in the thing, like mm -hmm. make a telegram too long mm -hmm. or the X on the, yep. you know. Um, did he, he, it seemed like he struggled with not breaking that barrier of mm -hmm. whether it's the State Department <coughs> people or even presidents mm -hmm. who just Mm -hmm. you know, kind of brushed him off mm -hmm. here and there. Um, how, did, yeah. how did he struggle with that, and, and how did he keep going? Yeah. You know? Well, you know, I mean, he struggled with it a lot. That's a very accurate portrayal of his um, attitude. How did he keep going? Well, he almost didn't. I mean, he came so close to quitting several different uh, times, and the psychological price he paid uh, was uh, very heavy uh, for this. He had, however, a very strong sense of responsibility uh, and uh, duty, which was there, uh, that he had to keep raising this issue. But if you think about it, this is how great intellectual changes take place. They normally don't take place gradually. They take place um, uh, abruptly. If you uh, read Thomas Kuhn on the structure of scientific revolutions and the way in which paradigms shift very dramatically, this is perfectly consistent. This would be a beautiful case study uh, with this. Enough disconfirming evidence about some existing thesis begins to arise that uh, suddenly somebody says the emperor has no clothes and everybody says, yes, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, yes, Stalin is a danger. And this can happen overnight and there are many historical examples of this. So I think that's the best context to understand the, the long telegram. I'll stay on this side of the room sure. for a moment. Walt, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, two quick questions. One, was he a student of Freud and Jung? Was, uh, as a young man, was he reading the mm -hmm. texts? And, and then secondly, if we could, by magic, bring him in here and sit him down with you and Mike, mm -hmm. um, what do you imagine he'd be telling us about international affairs now and the place <laughs> of the United States? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'll take the second one first. If we could bring him back and sit him down between uh, uh, Mike and myself, have him right here, he would immediately have a long list of things that were wrong uh, with Milwaukee, with Wisconsin, with the United States, uh, and with Western civilization. And that's what we would hear. Uh, you would not hear anything that would be reassuring from him. Uh, he could do it with great style. He might be able to do it under certain circumstances with a great deal of humor. He was uh, and could be very funny uh, on occasion. Uh, but he would use this opportunity to uh, do a stem-winding sermon uh, toward all of you if he, were, if he were here. And that kind of connects with Freud because uh, he was certainly aware of Freud. He was friends with Anna Freud. Um, he did read some Freud in the uh, 1930s. There was a moment in which, it was more than a moment, it was about eight months or so, when he had something like a nervous breakdown uh, in the mid-1930s uh, and was treated by a Freudian uh, physician. She was not a psychiatrist, but she was a physician who had gotten into Freud deeply. And in the diaries, there are uh, imaginary conversations between two Georges. One of them is a Freudian. And the other is a um, the other is a Calvinist, uh, <laughs> and the Freudian George is uh, saying, "Well, you know, it's it's uh, of course you are ill because it's all the trauma that you've been through. It's your upbringing. It's how you were raised. It's the loss of a mother. You know, all of this. It's going to be you know, why we it would be no surprise that you are ill. Uh, you must trust in Frau Doctor, you know, et cetera." But the Calvinist George says, no way, that's a cop out, you know, uh, buck up, Kenan, you know. <laughs> Take responsibility for your own situation. <laughs> so, and I think that's very, cl that's closer to the real Kenan, uh, the Calvinist Kenan more than the Freudian Kenan. Brian, I said you pointed to somebody with a microphone. Yes, sir. Uh, the earlier concept of spheres of influence, <laughs> did that influence his uh, thinking about containment? Yes, uh, very much so, because um, he believed in spheres of influence. Um, he was noted, although he didn't, didn't like the term, as a quote-unquote realist um, uh, student of international relations, which means uh, respecting the configurations of power which exist uh, in the world. Uh, he always thought that there would be uh, spheres of influence, uh, and for him, uh, a multipolar world in which there were four or five great powers, each with its own sphere of influence, probably was the optimal configuration of power. He was uncomfortable with the bipolar world because he thought it was so dangerous when both sides had uh, nuclear weapons. But when it came to uh, Eastern Europe, um, he's not somebody who wants to overtly challenge Soviet influence in Eastern Europe. He thought that this would be too dangerous. He said, uh, Poland is always going to be under some Soviet uh, influence, um, uh, and uh, the Baltic states, other countries like that. So when the Soviet Union actually does break up, when Eastern Europe liberates itself in the uh, 1980s, he was profoundly depressed by this, <laughs> uh, because uh, far from seeing it as vindication, he really thought that it was opening up a can of worms and uh, that it was going to uh, uh, be an unpredictable situation. Uh, and the nuclear danger just overlies everything that he uh, does, and that's uh, a big key to understanding this. Um, so, uh, yeah, he believed in spheres of influence, for sure. A couple of more questions, I think. The gentleman there now has the mic. For all the darkness in his life, both personally and professionally, it doesn't appear that he ever became hopeless. I mean, he kept kept on keeping on. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, I don't think he ever became hopeless, uh, although he would say in his diary <clears throat> constantly, everything is hopeless, there is no hope, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, if you remember or, or keep in mind that this is somebody who produced something like 21 books, this is somebody who lectured uh, thousands of times around the country, this is somebody who was never a formal teacher in the sense of a professor with an academic appointment. He was always appointed at the Institute for Advanced Study, which had no students. Uh, 
Uh, but he loved uh, lecturing, and he, was, uh, he loved teaching, and he was very good uh, at this. He didn't like grading papers, uh, so maybe, uh, that's why he turned down Yale four or five times. Uh, but uh, uh, these are all elements of hope. He was a dedicated father. Uh, he was married to the same woman for 74 years. Uh, there is hope in these things as well. Although, as I point out in the book, uh, there were affairs uh, uh, as well, which were going on. Uh, not unusual, perhaps, among people of his generation at, in that period, but it was a very stable marriage. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and then finally, with regard to hope, there was religious faith. And um, I think one of the things that few people understand uh, about George Kennan is uh, how deeply religious he was, uh, and, uh, or maybe more accurately, how deeply religious he became in later life. I don't think he was particularly that uh, as a young man. I think like a lot of young people, he rejected uh, the religion of his parents, being forced to go to church, all of that sort of thing. But uh, in the uh, 1950s, uh, he rediscovers uh, religion. He affiliates uh, with the Presbyterian Church in Princeton, later transferred to the Episcopal Church. But it's, uh, he is doing lay sermons. He's very much taking on board uh, many of the uh, philosophical religious assumptions of Reinhold Niebuhr, for example. Uh, and in one of his last books, uh, Around the Cragged Hill, uh, there is an extraordinary uh, chapter on religious faith, which is his own uh, view uh, of, of religion, uh, which is well worth uh, reading. So um, he actually lectured uh, three or four times on the subject of hope, and he said that there is hope. Uh, there is hope of redemption. There is hope in love, in the relationships that you form with those you love. There is hope, uh, he said, in professionalism which can be uh, a way of crossing a great abyss uh, in life if one does have a profession and seeks to do well uh, at it. So yes, I would say the hope was there, uh, mixed with this deep, extraordinary pessimism, and therein lies one other complexity. One final brief yep, question, sure. yes. I wanted to ask about the uh, events of, 19, of the 1980s with mm -hmm. the liberation of Poland, with mm -hmm. the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. with the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. Did he give any credit to Pope John Paul II or to Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> Not to Ronald no. Reagan. <laughs> uh, no, he was very nervous about all of this. Um, and um, he really felt that these people, the Pope, Valenza, uh, Havel, Reagan, Thatcher, were all pushing too hard. Uh, and uh, he really believed that uh, this was an extraordinary, extraordinarily dangerous moment. And we know that it was now. We know that probably 1983, 84 was the second most dangerous period in the, in the entire Cold War, um, second only to the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is the period right before uh, Gorbachev takes over because the Soviet leadership was ill, dying, comatose, uh, and uh, you know, there were all kinds of alerts that were being called and, and whatnot. On Reagan, it's fascinating, uh, and I do a whole chapter on this. Uh, Ronald Reagan um, was, I firmly believe, the American president closest to George Kennan, philosophically, on the issue first of nuclear weapons, because Ronald Reagan was a nuclear abolitionist and had been for many years before he became president, uh, on the issue of uh, achieving a 50% cut in ICBMs, which was a proposal of Reagan, which paralleled a proposal from Kennan just at, at, this, at this point. Um, on the original idea of containment, uh, if you go back to 1947, uh, what George was saying about the need to apply pressure to contain and maybe even strain the Soviet system, uh, yeah. doing it very calmly and peacefully, but nonetheless try to make things more difficult for it so that someday a, 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 Russian, a Soviet leader would emerge who would just say, we can't continue in this way. That was Kennan in 1947. That's Reagan uh, in 1982, 83. Uh, and it's very close. You can take some of the Reagan national security documents and set them alongside Kennan's documents from 40 years earlier, and they could be almost parallel. But could you get through 
could you convince George of this? No way. I tried and tried and tried <laughs> and got nowhere. Uh, and I finally uh, concluded that it really was an issue of style and manner, and that was something else that was very important to Kenneth. Um, he really believed, and this gets back to his elitism, he really believed that uh, professionalism could only come from certain people. Uh, and the idea that someone who was as alien as Ronald Reagan uh, could actually implement George Kennan's ideas and could bring the Cold War to a conclusion. Somebody who was a movie actor, somebody who was a television star, somebody who was from California, for God's sake. <laughs> This <laughs> just could not register with, with poor George. And so it's really very sad that uh, uh, Kennan never really fully understood Reagan. Um, and Reagan never really, I think, uh, made an effort to try to understand Kennan. I'm going to have to wrap things up here. I do want to say this, this book uh, won the Pulitzer this year, biography. Uh, you knew George Kennan as, uh, as well as, as anyone, I guess. Um, would he have approved? What do you think he would think of this book? I have no idea what he would think of this book. <laughs> I know what he told me early on, uh, which is uh, that he did not want it to be hagiography. He wanted me to take the evidence uh, seriously. He wanted me to talk about the strengths and the weaknesses, the good and the bad. Uh, he was himself a professional historian uh, in the last half of his life. And while he never wrote a biography, he wanted to. He wanted to write Chekhov's biography. But he knew enough about the writing of history to know that biography can't be any good uh, if, in fact, it's monodimensional. Uh, biography, to be good, has got to be re reflect the complexities, the ambivalences, the uh, almost Shakespearean contradictions that you can see uh, in, a, in a personality. Uh, George loved Shakespeare for that reason. So while I don't doubt that there are many things that he would uh, question about this book, and there are some things that he would have found embarrassing about this book, I like to think that on the whole he would have approved and would have been pleased that it won a Pulitzer because he won two of them himself. But you never know, and I think probably that's just as well for a biographer, never to know what the subject of the biography would actually think. It's a good, it's a good way to leave it, it seems to me. Professor John Lewis Gaddis, we appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. Uh, we hope to see you next time on The Issues. Have a great afternoon.